All right, reliance damages and then non justification for expect damages rule, reliance damages, and non recoverable damages. Damages, damages, damages. And there's other videos on damages, so look them up or <laughs> look up your outline because I got some pieces to put together. All right, restatement 349 damages based on reliance interest. As an alternative to the measure of damages stated in 347, the injured party has a right to damages based on his reliance interest, including expenditures made in preparation for performance or in performance, less any loss that the party in breach can prove with reasonable certainty the injured party would have suffered had the contract been performed. When might you request reliance damages? Examples, profits of a contract are too speculative. So you can't figure it out, you can't get them. Promissory estoppel, we already know. You did things in reliance of a promise. Uh, the profits are too speculative are our Watzerman case and our promissory estoppel is our Walser case. Restatement 349 goes on to say as an alternative no, it literally says the exact same thing I just said. Limitation on reliance damages. Essential reliance. A and B enter a contract for A to build B a chair for $30. A believes that building a chair will only cost him $20. As A begins ordering the materials for the chair, he discovers that building the chair will cost him $50. A builds the chair and spends $50. Prior to delivery, B tells A that he is breaching and the agreement will not and will not accept delivery of the chair. Chair. Damages. A's expectation damages are $30. A's reliance damages are $50. If A seeks reliance damages, his reliance damages will be limited to the contract price. So, he can't get more than than he, than the contract. No limitation on reliance, where there are no limitations on reliance damages, incidental reliance. However, reliance damages are not always limited by the contract price. A and B contract for A to inspect a home B intends to buy. B agrees to pay $2,000 for the inspection. A concludes the house has no defects. B purchases the home. After the purchase, B discovers a defect that will cost $200,000 to repair. Not good. B files suit to recover reliance damages on A. B may collect $200,000 even though the contract price was only $2,000. Incidental reliance damages are not limited to the contract price. So, Wartzman v. Hightower Productions. So, this is the sitting on top of a pole case. Were reliance damages appropriate? The answer is yes. Where anticipated profits are too speculative to be determined, monies spent in part performance, in preparation for, and in reliance on the contract are recoverable. Question, did I, Hightower have a duty to mitigate damages by paying for a securities lawyer? No. The party who is in default may not mitigate his damages by showing that the other party could have reduced those damages by expending large amounts of money or incurring substantial obligation. So they tried to say, well, you could have hired the securities one and then you wouldn't be out the, this money. And they say, no, you can't require the other one to mitigate in circumstances like this where there's like it's a lot of money or incurring substantial obligation to mitigate that's not no and then the doctrine of un the doctrine of avoidable consequences moreover does not apply where both parties have equal opportunity to mitigate so in this case the lawyer that they hired did a horrible job and then said oh you're going to have to hire a securities lawyer to fix what i didn't do 
Like what you specifically asked me to do, I didn't do. And now you've got to pay $15,000 for the securities lawyer. And they were like, well, we don't have that money. Can you pay for it? And they were like, no. Joke's on them because if they had, maybe they wouldn't have been sued and they wouldn't have had to pay all the money, all the expectation. Or they, they paid reliance damages because the expectation damages were too speculative. So money spent in part performance, in preparation, and in reliance. And that is exactly what the numbers that they did have for that. So should have done it. Restatement 349, damages based on reliance interest. As an alternative to the measure of damages state, did I... I literally wrote that three times. So apparently it's important because Halfin must have had three slides and that's why I wrote it three times. As an alternative to the measure of damages stated in 347, the injured party has the right to damages based on his reliance interest, including expenditures made in preparation for performance, in performance, and less any loss that the party in breach can prove with reasonable certainty, the injured party would have suffered had the contract been performed. So they get their reliance, what they've already spent, but if the other party can prove that they would have been out money, but it has to be like tangible proven money, then they can mitigate with that money, but they can't mitigate with saying, well, you should have hired a securities lawyer. That doesn't work because it's, it was too, it's a substantial cost. And then Walser says, did the district court err in instructing the jury to limit the plaintiff's damages to out-of-pocket damages? And they said, no. With respect to promissory estoppel damages, a court has discretion to select either expectation or reliance damages as deemed appropriate under the circumstances. When a promise is enforced pursuant to section 90, which is promissory estoppel, the remedy granted for breach may be limited as justice requires. Relief may be limited to damages measured by the promise, the promisee's reliance. And restatement 90, we know part, uh, Comment D says, a promise binding under this section is a contract and full scale enforcement by normal remedies is often appropriate with the same factors which bear on whether any relief should be granted also bear on the character and extent of the remedy, which is if so for justice sake. In particular, relief may sometimes be limited to restitution, what the benefit conferred was, or to damages, what are the costs incurred, or specific relief, specific performance, measured by the extent of the promisee's reliance rather than in terms of the promise. So not expectation, but reliance, basically right there. Disagreement as to proper remedy for promissory estoppel. Expectation damages. Either the promise is binding or it isn't, is the argument. And this is a good way to protect reliance interest. And then we have reliance damages fit between interest and damages. Hard to award expectation interest for a contract that wasn't even formed. Yeah, and that's, that's what promissory estoppel is. It's a contract that wasn't even formed. Uh, discretion, different damages for different facts. So a court needs to look at the facts and then they decide which one they wanna give. Note, according to the restatement, reliance damages, just like expectation damages, are limited to foreseeability, causation, certainty, and mitigation. They are limited to foreseeability, causation, certainty, and mitigation. Reliance damages, just like mitigation, are limited to foreseeability, causation, certainty, and mitigation. And then non-recoverable damages, which was going to be a whole thing in itself. No, we'll do it now. Okay, non-recoverable damages. Zapata Hermanos, about the cookie tins. 
the CISG, which is the international code of something goods, did not authorize attorneys, attorney's fees. The CISG deals with substance of contract law, not procedure. Attorney's fees are a matter of procedure, not substance. So contract law, so they wouldn't let them get the money because they said, no, if we're going to use CISG like an Erie issue, uh, that would go to the substance of the contract, but we're not going to give you procedure because procedure isn't an Erie thing. Procedure is where you bring it. So no attorney's fees in that case. Contract law is not like tort law. A breach of contract is not a wrong. Many breaches are involuntary or, the, or an efficient breach. So this is why we have an American rule that does not allow for attorney's fee in contract cases unless there is misconduct in the litigation of the case itself or the standard rules of civil procedure provide such a remedy. To overcome Amer the American rule, you'd need something pretty significant, like a statute that says you get it for this case. Or, and generally, this is not available for a breach of contract. Potential expectations where they fall under inc incidental and consequential damages, so like third-party litigation, um, sometimes we'll have attorney's fees, where they are agreed to as part of the terms of the contract. Obviously, you can always contract around. California has enacted legislation that provides that if a contract grants attorney's fees to one party, the agreement will apply uh, to the other as well because that's fair and equitable if they should prevail in litigation. Where there is litigation misconduct, such as Rule 11 sanctions, that's not really an exception because the Rule 11 is is outside of that contract issue. And in some states, insurance cases award them. So Ehrlich v. Menizm. Ehrlich. Two ways to collect for emotional distress. If negligent breach of contract is recoverable as an independent tort cause of action, or if emotional distress is a consequential damage of a breach of contract. But that is not the black letter law because we're gonna go down and explain like, you're usually not gonna get it for emotional distress. So tort versus contract. The distinction between tort and contract is well grounded in common law and divergent objectives underlie the remedies created in these two areas. So as we said, like in a tort, someone has been a wrong actor. In contract law, that's not, we aren't making those moral judgments. Whereas contract actions are created to enforce the intentions of the party to the agreement, tort law is primarily designed to vindicate social policy. Can a plaintiff collect for emotional distress flowing from the negligent breach of a contract? Plaintiff's theory. Mental distress is a foreseeable consequence of negligent breaches of standard commercial contracts. Courts holding. No independent tort duty for negligent breach of contract. Whether a defendant owes a duty of care is a question of law. Its existence depends upon the foreseeability of the risk and the weighing of policy considerations for and against the imposition of liability. So courts will generally enforce the breach of a contractual promise through contract law, except when the actions constitute the, bre constitute the breach violate a social policy that merits the imposition of tort remedies. Restrictions on contract remedies serve to protect the freedom to bargain over specific risks and to promote contract formation by limiting liability to the value of the promise. Special relation exceptions, special relationship test. Breach of good faith and fair dealing in an insurance contract gives rise to tort remedies, but it's specific to insurance. Courts admit that this precedent itself is controversial. And then independent tort. A tortious breach of contract may be found when the breach is accompanied by a traditional common law tort, such as fraud or conversion. The means used to breach the contract are tortious, 
involving deceit or undue coercion, or one party intentionally breaches the contract intending or knowing that such a breach will cause severe, unmitigatable harm in the form of mental anguish, personal hardship, or substantial consequential damages which sounds a lot like the Ehrlich case, but we're gonna keep going because they did not say that in that case. Even if there were an independent duty, here it is, no California cases have allowed recovery for emotional distress arising solely out of property damage. So if you're getting emotional distress out of property damage, it's not going to work. And a pre-existing contractual relationship without more will not support a recovery for mental suffering where the defendant's tortious conduct has resulted only in economic injury to the plaintiff. So if it's just economic, it's also not going to suffice. It's got to be physical injury. Public policy supports a similar limit where the negligence concerns the construction of a home. So... That's the Ehrlich case. Can emotional distress be considered a consequential damage of a breach of contract? A contracting party cannot be required to assume limitless responsibility for all consequences of a breach. Adding an emotional distress component to recovery for construction defects could increase the already prohibitively high cost of housing in California, which is true. But in case of Ehrlich, like the house was falling down, so... Are we saying it would have been better if they would have gotten hurt and then they could have recovered? That's a bad public policy. Okay, so restatement 353, loss due to emotional disturbance. Recovery for emotional disturbance will be excluded unless the breach also caused bodily harm or the contract or the breach is of such a kind that serious emotional disturbance was particularly likely result. What, what about punitive damages? Restatement 355 says punitive damages are not recoverable for breach of contract unless the conduct constituting the breach is also a tort for which punitive damages are recoverable, which will be another cause of action, not just contract claim. Why? Contract damages are merely supposed to compensate. Breach of contract is not about fault. It would be inefficient to allow punitive damages and could leave P worse off or with a windfall. And we're going to finish, we're going to stop there.